This is the IELTS listening test. You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between an assistant at a community centre and a man who wants to join some evening classes. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Hello, Eastwood Community Centre. Oh, hello. My name's Andrew Dyson. I'm calling about the evening classes you offer. OK, Mr Dyson. Are there any classes in particular that you're interested in? Yes, you've got a class called Painting with Watercolours, I believe. That's right. It's a popular class, so this term it'll be moving to the hall, so they've got more room. Right. I know it's on Tuesdays, but what time exactly? It was 6.30 last term, but let me just have a look at the details. OK, it'll be 7.30 this time. Probably it suits more people. Well, it's my wife who's really interested, and that'll be good for her because she's home from work by 7.15. That'll give her just enough time to get there. Um, what does she need to bring? OK, well, paints are provided by the tutor. I know that. Um, the information says she'll need just a jar for water and some pencils for drawing. There are also lots of aprons here, so she needn't worry what she's wearing. And the cost for four classes is $45, including paints, as I said. OK. Now, we're both quite keen on the Maori language class. There are spaces on the next course, so you could join that. Oh, good. Which room will that be in? When you come in through the entrance of the community centre building, you'll need to go straight up the stairs in front of you, all the way to the top, and it's the small room you'll find there. I see. All right, and let me just check when it's starting. I heard from someone that the July course has been delayed until August. I'm afraid so, and we're halfway through the June course at the moment, so there's not much point you taking that. I guess we'll have to wait then. Well, when you do come, the tutor recommends bringing a small recorder with you, just so you can listen again later. And uh, the cost for five classes is currently $40. OK. Useful information to know. Um... There's one more class I'm interested in. That's the digital photography class. Oh, I've taken that class myself. The tutor's very good. That'll be in room nine, and it's starting in two weeks' time, in the evening, every Wednesday at six o'clock. Um, obviously I need to bring the camera with me. I suppose it'd be useful to have the instructions that go with the camera too? I'd say so. Um... Some people bring along a lot of accessories, like extra lenses, but there's really no need for this class. It's mainly focusing on composition, really, and getting the most out of the basic camera. That's exactly what I need. And how much does it cost? Uh, let's see. For four classes, it's $35. 
But if you take eight, it works out as fifty-five dollars. So you're making a bit of a saving, fifteen dollars. That is. I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Okay. Now just another question for the watercolors class. I've just remembered that my wife asked me to find out about the level. Who's it for? Okay. Well, you don't have to be very skilled or anything like that. It's designed for beginners, actually. People who might see art as a hobby rather than as a professional opportunity. That sounds like my wife. And、um, who do I talk to if I want to find out some more about the Maori language classes? Probably best to talk to the tutor directly. He'll be in the office in about half an hour. His name's Jason Kuai. That's K A H U I. Good. I'll give him a call. Oh, if you do decide to come to the photography class. Don't forget to look at your camera battery and make sure it's charged. I know it sounds obvious, but I've seen a few people suddenly find the cameras stopped working right in the middle of class. Yes, I can imagine it'd be easy to forget that. Oh, that reminds me. In the final week of the photography course, is it right that there's a visit to a show in the local area? I work in the city, you see, so I might have to come home early for that one. Yes, they'll decide the date once the class has started. Is there anything else I can? That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part two. You will hear a project manager talking to voluntary workers about the tasks that need to be done. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Good morning. It's great to see so many people here. Thank you all very much for coming. Well, as you know, the community gardens at Hadley Park are really not looking as good as they should. <laughs> Quite bad, really. And although the local council has a budget. To deal with some of the problems, we do need volunteers for other tasks. 
If you don't mind, I'm going to divide you into two groups. So, everyone on this side of the room is Group A, and the rest of you are Group B. So, Group A, there are a couple of things we'd like you to help with.、Um, first of all, don't worry about any litter or empty bottles you see lying about. One of the local schools has offered to help out with that as part of their own environmental project. The priority for you will be to give us a hand with the new wooden fencing. It needs constructing along parts of the bicycle track, as there are parts which have now fallen down or broken. As I'm sure you've seen, you've probably also noticed that some of the pathways that come from the bicycle track are quite narrow, and there are plans to make them wider. But the council will be dealing with that later in the year, and they've also promised to produce some informational signs about the plants in the gardens. Hopefully, they'll be up in a few weeks' time. The other thing we're doing is getting rid of some of the foreign species that are growing in the gardens, and putting back some native plants and trees. So you'll be doing some digging for us and getting those into the ground. So Group A, there's some items you'll need to bring along with you. I was going to say raincoats, but the forecast has changed, so you can leave those at home. I'd definitely recommend a strong pair of boots. Waterproof would be best. It's quite muddy at the moment, and your own gloves would also be advisable. Tools will be available: spades and hammers, that kind of thing. You just need to make sure they go back in the trucks, and oh, there's no need to worry about food and drink, as we'll be supplying sandwiches and coffee, possibly some biscuits even. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you will have some time to look at the questions fifteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions fifteen to twenty. Okay, Group B, your turn. Does everyone have a copy of the plan? Oh, great. Okay, we'll all be meeting in the car park. That's on the bottom of the plan. See? Now, if you've been assigned to the vegetable beds, to get there you go. Out of the car park and go up the footpath until you reach the circle of trees. There they are in the middle of the plan, and you see that the footpath goes all the way around them. Well, on the left-hand side of that circular footpath, there's a short track which takes you directly to the vegetable beds. You can see a bamboo fence marked just above them. All right. Okay. If you're helping out with the beehives, pay attention. Look again at the circle of trees in the middle of the plan and the footpath that goes around them. On the right side of that circle, you can see that the footpath goes off in an easterly direction. Heading towards the right-hand side of the plan, and then the path splits into two, and you can either go up or down. 
You want the path that heads down. And at the end of this, you see two areas divided by a bamboo fence. And as we're looking at the plan, the beehives are on the right of the fence. The smaller section, I mean. Now, don't worry, all the bees have been removed. You just need to transport the hives back to the car park. OK, for the seating, look at the circular footpath. At the top of it, there's a path that goes from there and takes you up to the seating area, alongside the bicycle track and with a good view of the island, I suppose. OK, if you're volunteering for the Adventure Playground area, let's start from the car park again and go up the footpath, but then you want the first left turn. Go up there and then you see there's a short path that goes off to the right. Go down there and that's the Adventure Playground area, above the bamboo fence. That fence does need repairing, I'm afraid. Right, what else? Oh yes, the sand area. We've got that circular footpath in the middle. Find the track that goes east, towards the right-hand side of the plan. And where that track divides, you need the little path that goes up towards the bicycle track. The sand area is just above the bamboo fence there. And finally, the pond area. So it's on the left-hand side of your plan, towards the top, just above the fruit bushes and to the left of the little path. OK, as I said already, That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two students discussing their assignments. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hi, Mike. How's it going? Actually, I was up last night with an assignment, so yeah, I'm tired, but I guess we'd better sort this presentation out. Well, we've done enough background reading, but I think we need to organise exactly what we're going to say about biofuels during the presentation and the order. I thought we could start by asking our audience what car engines were first designed to run on, fossil fuels or biofuels. Nice idea. Yes. When most people think about cars and fuel, they think about all the carbon dioxide that's produced, but they don't realise that that wasn't always the case. 
You're probably right. The earliest car engines ran on fuel made from corn and peanut oil, didn't they? Yes. The manufacturers used the corn and peanut oil and turned them into a kind of very pure alcohol. You mean ethanol? Yes. In fact, most biofuels are still based on ethanol. Actually, I've got some notes here about the process of turning plant matter into ethanol, the chemical reactions and the fermentation stages. And it's interesting. The other students would appreciate it, but different biofuels use different processes. And if we give a general description, there's a risk we'll get it wrong, and then the tutor might mark us down. I'd rather we focus on the environmental issues. Fair enough. So, um, the main plants that are used for biofuel production now are sugarcane, corn, and canola. Of all of them, canola is probably the least harmful because machines that use it don't produce as much carbon monoxide.、Mm. Sugarcane seems to be controversial. It doesn't require as much fertilizer as corn does to grow, but when they burn the sugarcane fields, that releases loads of greenhouse gases. Yes, but some critics have suggested that the production of corn ethanol uses up more fossil fuel energy than the biofuel energy it eventually produces. For that reason, I'd say it was more harmful to the environment. I see what you mean. You're probably right. It's interesting how everyone saw the biofuel industry as the answer to our energy problems. In some ways, biofuels have created new problems. Well, in the USA, I wouldn't say that farmers are having problems. The biofuel industry for them has turned out to be really profitable. I think, though, that even in the USA, ethanol is still only used as an additive to gasoline or petrol. The problem is that it still has to be transported by trucks or rail because they haven't built any pipelines to move it. Once they do, it'll be cheaper, and the industry might move forward. That'll have to happen one day. At least the government are in favour of biofuel development. Yes, but Brazil's probably in the lead as far as biofuels are concerned. They've got to the point where they don't need to import any oil now, which is great. And the industry in Brazil employs a huge number of people, but is it sustainable? I mean, as the population grows, and there are more vehicles on the roads, and there's more machinery, surely they can't depend so much on sugar cane. At some point, there has to be a limit on how much land can be used for sugar cane production. Certainly, if you want to preserve natural habitats and native wildlife. I think that whatever problems Brazil's facing now, the same will be true for any country. You have to weigh up the pros and cons. Well, we probably won't see an increase in biofuel use. I mean, they won't replace fossil fuels until we can find ways to produce them cheaply and quickly, and with less cost to the environment. Making sure they require minimal energy to produce. Exactly, and in a way that means they have to cost less than fossil fuels. Certainly, when you're filling up your car. Yes, and whatever other kind of engines use fossil fuels at the moment. Now listen and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty.
All right, so in the last section of the presentation, what problems are we focusing on? Well, we've already had a look at different types of pollution in the first section, so we can leave that out. But the biggest issue related to biofuels is that land is now being used to grow biofuel crops, and that's contributing to global hunger. Indeed. It doesn't seem right we're using corn to run cars when people can't afford to buy it to eat. Yes, let's talk about that. The other thing is that in some countries, the way that biofuel crops are grown and harvested still produces a great deal of pollution, really damaging to the atmosphere. OK, that's definitely an issue we should look at. Let's not finish on a negative note, though. Why don't we talk about the potential new sources of biofuel? So rather than corn and sugarcane, what other plants could be used? Mm, good. Some companies are exploring the possibility of using wood and seeing how that can be used to make ethanol. Yes, and algae is another possibility. You can grow it in any water and it absorbs pollutants too. Mm, I read that. And grasses, they're another plant that researchers are investigating as a biofuel. And these kind of plants aren't used as food, which is why... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a lecture about how the production of ceramics, such as plates, pots and glass, first began. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi everyone. Today I'm going to be talking about the origins of ceramics. So first of all, let's start off with what is a ceramic? Well, generally speaking, ceramics are what you get when you apply heat to certain inorganic, non-metallic solids and then allow them to cool. And examples of ceramics are everyday things like earthenware pots, crockery, glassware and even concrete. So how did it all begin? Well, it all started around 29,000 years ago when humans discovered 
that if you dig up some soft clay from the ground, mould it into a shape, and then heat it up to a very high temperature, when it cools, the clay has been transformed into something hard and rigid. And so what did those first humans do with their discovery? Well, they created figurines, which were small statues and which depicted animals or gods or any shape that the clay could be moulded into. And all this activity was centred around southern Europe, where there is also evidence of ceramics that were created much later. The early humans also found a practical use for their discovery, such as storing things like grain, although there were drawbacks. The pots were porous, so that although they could carry water in them, it wasn't possible to store it over a long period. And also they were quite brittle and shattered very easily if they were dropped. But despite these problems, it was many thousands of years before there were any improvements. In China, at around 200 BC, they discovered that by adding minerals to the clay, they could improve both the appearance and the strength of the ceramics. But it took nearly a thousand years before they perfected the process to produce high-quality ceramics known as porcelain. And once they had perfected the process, they kept it a secret for another thousand years. Compared to the first ceramics, porcelain was lighter, finer, harder and whiter and became an important commodity in China's trading with the rest of the world for hundreds of years. In fact, it became so valuable that it was known as white gold and spies were sent to China to discover what they did to the clay to produce such high-quality merchandise. It wasn't until the 18th century that the secret began to unravel. A German alchemist called Johann Friedrich Bottke was asked by the king to make gold out of lead. Unfortunately, Bottke failed to achieve this and soon gave up. But in order to please the king, he attempted to make high-quality porcelain. And after many years of experimentation, he discovered that by adding quartz and a material called china stone to very high-quality clay, he managed to get the same results that the Chinese had been achieving for the last 1,000 years. We'll now look at another ceramic which is made from mixing sand with minerals and heating to over 600 degrees Celsius. When this mixture cools, the result is, of course, glass. The main difference between ceramics made from clay and glass is that clay is made up of crystalline plates which become locked together in the cooling process whereas glass cools too quickly for crystals to form. Apart from that, the process of heating up naturally occurring materials to transform them is the same. The origins of glass date back to 3500 BC, but it wasn't until the Roman Empire 2000 years ago that the art of glass blowing and the practical uses of glass became more widespread. One of the more innovative uses was to use it in windows, as up until then they had just been holes in walls. It must have been very drafty in those days. The Romans were also responsible for inventing concrete, and although the origins are uncertain, Experts think that this is largely due to the high level of volcanic activity in the area. 
The Romans observed that when volcanic ash mixes with water and then cools, it gets extremely hard and almost impossible to break up. The chemical reaction that follows is very complex and continues for many years, and the concrete just keeps getting harder. Evidence of this are the numerous Roman remains that are still standing, many of which are almost completely intact. One of the most important facts about concrete for the Romans was that it can be created under water. As the Roman Empire grew, the Romans needed to take control of the seas, and for this they needed to build harbours capable of holding a fleet of ships. Pouring concrete mixture into the sea immediately started the hardening process, and rather than just dissolving in the mass of water, the substance was tough and long-lasting. This strange characteristic of concrete made a significant contribution to the success of the Roman Empire. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.